Chinese groups are banding together to stand up to the CCP. Can they force it to change? Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. The People's Republic of China is a nation of many nations. Dozens of happy ethnic minority groups from places like Tibet, East Turkestan, and Southern Mongolia came together to be forcibly conquered by the People's Liberation Army. Yes, after decades of struggle, the communists have finally, finally turned China into the shape of a giant chicken. But some of these chicken parts, I mean captive nations, are now banding together to stand up to the Chinese Communist Party. For more, I sat down with Seon Kim. He's the director of the Captive Nations Coalition, which is part of the Committee on Present Danger, China. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Chris. So tell me, what is the, what is the Captive Nations Coalition? So the Captive Nations Coalition is a coalition that's made up of individuals from communities that are um, that are and have been taken over by the CCP. Okay. Um, so mainly those communities uh, of Southern Mongolia, mm -hmm. East Turkestan, Tibet, and really all of China as well. And um, we have also expanded uh, to communities that are under the threat of takeover by the CCP. So specifically nations that are under the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. as well as other political dealings um, with the Chinese Communist Party at the present time. So like how the FBI has been uh, warning about China's Operation Fox Hunt, where they intimidate Chinese diaspora overseas and trying to get them to go back to mainland China. That's also part of this captive nation? Absolutely. Those individuals are targeted for a specific reason. Um, mainly, these are dissidents from China that um, have been speaking out against the government policies um, set by the party itself. Um, and the Chinese Communist Party simply does not want that to be alive as it is in this country or elsewhere around the world. So. Absolutely, they are part of this entire uh, coalition and really a more of a bigger campaign mm -hmm. to battle the CCP as much as we can. And so this is why the captive nations is not just ethnicities like Tibetans or Mongolians or Uyghurs, but you also include Hong Kong. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hong Kong and anybody who loves freedom but is under the threat of either losing that freedom or have lost that freedom under the grasp of the CCP. That is what the coalition is actually made up of. And you spearheaded this coalition, correct? Right now, I am spearheading it as a, as a, as a director. Um, mm -hmm. But it also came into being uh, because of the Committee on Present Danger China. Mm -hmm. And this idea came um, after we have discovered that there are a number of communities um, that could actually serve as evidence as to why the CCP is a criminal organization, uh, which is another project that we're working on. We're Labeling we, the CCP as a actual transnational criminal absolutely. organization. Absolutely. That is actually one of our main projects right now um, mm -hmm. to designate them because we have so many members, at least just within the coalition, that can actually speak about the horrors of the CCP. Um, I forgot to mention that the Falun Gong community is also a huge part of our coalition mm, as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I mention that very proudly because of the fact that the Falun Gong community, like many other communities before, uh, have been that voice mm -hmm. in the world where they have been, from the get-go, have been telling us all how much of a threat the CCP really is. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, many of us just didn't listen, including myself. Oh yeah? Right, absolutely. Who I thought at one point it was this crazy cult group, right, that wanted to negatively impact China. Mm. Right. It used to be uh, fairly pro-CCP. I was. I, ab I absolutely was. Um, and, you know, what's really interesting about that is that I was very pro-CCP until I started uh, college. Mm. Yeah. That, so you went, you went to college and became anti-communist. Very anti-communist. Um, so just to give you a short summary of it, um, up until uh, my first semester of my uh, freshman year in college, I thought, well, China's going to be that next big target uh, for success, for any global achievements. It seems like they're doing an amazing job. I mean, remember, I grew up in an age where Beijing Olympics was apparently the one of the biggest achievements by the Chinese government, right? Mm -hmm. So at one point, I, I thought, 
well, look, they've achieved all of this and they brought themselves out of, out of poverty and there's something that something must be being done right in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. So as I came to college though, um, I think one thing that really changed it all was actually looking at the other side, which I did not do. So one of the things I did was reading up on the Tiananmen Square massacre. Mm. Right. Why is it called a massacre? I mean, at one point I just thought, well, it's just every country has a protest, right? Maybe this was just one of them. You know, why make such a big deal about it? But as I read the memoirs of individuals that were actually underground, I thought, well, is this really the China that I read about mm. that I come to respect so much? Um, and and uh, the other thing that I would recommend everyone to do is actually talk to the people that have been oppressed by the CCP, which um, even going back to the Captive Nations Coalition, this um, such experiences actually became a, a cornerstone, at least in my heart, for me to just engage with all these communities. Mm. Um, I think one experience that I've had was talking to a Falun Gong practitioner. Um, and, and again, this was in the middle of winter in Flushing, I mean, right in front of the Queen's Library. Mm -hmm. These ladies who are in these yellow shirts, I would say, with the words that says Falun Dafa is good. And even in, I would even say, negative 20 degree winter, they they stand there and make sure that things are actually distributed. Things, so make sure it's that people have the information that they want them to have. And really, they're extremely genuine about it. Hmm. I know because I actually went over there and began a conversation with a lady. Oh. Which made a huge difference. Because right around that time, I still wasn't fully convinced that hmm. CCP is this evil. But then when I talked to this lady, um, something just opened within my heart. Hmm. And I say open because I felt like I was blind up until that point. I mm. still didn't really understand what it meant, but it just, something was telling me, you've been blind, but you're, something has been open. I was like, okay. Um, and it's, and it's something that this lady has said. Mm. This lady actually told me about the story of her sister, how she misses her sister. Uh, she says her sister's been tortured, um, arbitrarily arrested, all the, even after being released um, in China, um, and, and harassed every single day. And I think the other biggest factor was that she was extremely sincere and genuine about it. Now, anybody in that situation would be, but she also didn't say anything out of hatred against anybody. That's a, that's surprising. It is very surprising, and that I feel like was one of the biggest uh, th you know things that that just really opened up my heart. Hmm. You know, because I would I would have thought, well, if anybody did that to my family members, I would be I would be this angry, irrational person all the time, hmm. out of fear or what have you. But none of that was present in this lady. Hmm. So, um, and she was really genuine about um, just having this conversation with me. And at the end of that conversation, um, she gave me a hug. And I think that just, I mean, something just clicked on my mind and something, and I, I heard something um, in the lines of, this could have been your mom, your aunt, mm. anybody in your neighborhood that you knew that you held dear. How would you feel if something like that happened to one of them? So. A lot of things happen in that small span of time, but you know that was a, a very, very, very heavenly experience that mm. I've had that led me up to what, it, what I am today. Well, I think you touched on, that was a beautiful story, by the way, mm -hmm. but uh, you touched on something that um, a lot of people just don't know. Sure. Like they buy into the Chinese Communist Party propaganda about the Beijing Olympics. Uh, how is uh, the Captive Nations Coalition trying to uh, raise awareness about the crimes of the Chinese Communist Party? Well, firstly, um, we believe that personal testimonies, mm -hmm. first and foremost, is probably the most important and the most effective tools to create awareness and also um, create this environment where people can at least think about what they can do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we've been doing. The other thing that I would even uh, say uh, that makes a huge difference is that the Captive Nations Coalition have been also 
uh, united in a way that I haven't seen before in my entire time of getting involved in this issue, which has been eight years already. Mm -hmm. um, what I mean by that is, yes, I mean, over the years I've seen protests where you see different groups like, you know, Southern Mongolians, Tibetans, Taiwanese, Hong Kong, etc., etc., all sort of in the same protest, you know, yelling out uh, human rights atrocities on their own issues, right? And mm -hmm. then being united in whatever, whatever they were celebrating at that time or, or protesting at that time. But this coalition, I would say for the first time, have not only touched upon the human rights aspects of what been going on there but also at the same time it they are all united under this banner of we want genuine freedom and we will achieve it through the will of the global society pretty much hmm. specifically by the freedom loving people um, of the united states and really the rest of the world that truly understands what threat really means when it comes from an authoritarian government hmm. Um, so that was a that, that's a very beautiful part about the coalition because they are also serving as an example to the rest of the world of what could happen if you're compliant hmm. on tyranny or, or that and I'm not saying that these communities were compliant but you know at the end of the day these communities were extremely uh, weak yeah. militarily compared to compared to the CCP at that time. So look at Tibet, for example, they had no chance militarily against the Chinese, right? Um, but the takeover did happen. So stuff like that. We are touching upon a lot of the things that happened in the past and they're really showing it to the rest of the world, telling them that, look, whatever happened to these people in principle and in nature can also happen to all of us if we do not understand and come to this realization that the CCP is a threat and must be dealt with. Now, I know you were talking about um, using this coalition to present evidence. Where are you presenting that evidence? Because I imagine it's very difficult to actually apply pressure to the Chinese sure. Communist Party. Sure. So I, one of the things that the Chinese Communist Party feels is, I would say, yes, I mean, global, po global government's policies um, could be a factor. But I would say the biggest weapon that we have against them is societal awareness hmm. and societal unity that comes to the point of saying CCP is a threat because of look what has happened to the Falun Gong practitioners, Southern Mongolians, Tibetans, concentration camps in East Turkestan. They're afraid of that hmm. because once CCP loses this global standing, they absolutely have no more legitimacy in the world. And they don't have legitimacy in China in the first place. And somewhere along the lines, at one point in the future, we believe that the Chinese people will do something about it. We'll get to a point where they will say, we need to do something about this, even though it looks bleak right now because of the oppression that's present. But we believe that with such unity, right, from the outside world and with the Chinese people, that could really uh, make a difference. And unfortunately, right now, we don't see much of that, mm -hmm. um, but we hope to change it. So that's, that's, how, uh, that's what we're trying to do, just create, it, create this uh, unity. And, and that we have to come to a conclusion that the CCP is a threat to all of us, including the Chinese people. No more, uh, you know, a uh, friendly competition between nations, a place to invest bonds. Sure. How are you going to convince Wall Street of that? Well, Wall Street is a big problem and has been a big problem from the get-go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, remember, past administrations have opened up our markets to the Chinese Communist Party thinking that somehow with the liberal open economy, China will change, mm. right? Uh -huh. And look. Look what has happened, right? I mean, did they change? No, it, it progressively have gotten worse, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also right around that time when China entered the WTO, the persecution against the Falun Gong started, right? That should have been a big, big wake up call for the rest of the world. But hey, we went on to do more business with them. So how are we going to convince Wall Street? Well, to be honest, I don't think there's any need to convince anybody really. Mm. Because, um, and that's where the role of the, the TCO or the Transnational Criminal Organization effort or initiative by our part comes in, is that once you designate them for what they are, mm. anything that you do with them becomes at least being compliant with a criminal activity. Mm. 
So that's, I think that's why Apple has been fighting against the legislation to uh, the forced labor in China. Oh yeah, Apple and a number of other companies. I mean, they do not want to lose their mar marketing grounds firstly in China, but also, you know, uh, as it has been revealed in many of these like uh, you know cl classified documents or so a lot of the articles that are out there. I mean, a lot of our business executives and even our congressmen, right, mm -hmm. has had some very very, very, very uh, shady deals with the Chinese Communist Party um, indirectly. And through that, you see the nature of how they work. Mm. They're, yeah, because the way that they do things isn't respectable by all means. And that should scare us mm -hmm. because they're not playing in terms of the rules that we have, you know, we have uh, created. Normal countries don't try and honey trap. No, we don't. No country would try to do that in the in the scale that the CCP is doing right now. So, mm -hmm. well, so you said a big part of this is uh, raising awareness. People watching. Yeah. Obviously, the people watching are interested and want to know what's happening. Sure. But how can they play a role in like spreading awareness? How can they feel like they're doing something to make a change? Well, firstly, um, don't stop talking about it. Mm. Talk to every single one of your family members if you have to. And I believe that if every single American does that, at least here, it will make a difference. Why? Because I believe that individuals may push for policies, right? Call up their congressmen. It's your right. We have to exercise it. And by doing that, I believe that we're achieving a lot of things together. You're not only having a moral ground and protecting it and exercising it, but you're also preserving the democracy that exists here by engaging with your elected representatives. Remember, you're the one that voted those people in to office, utilize it. On the same token, um, you know, think twice about what you buy. Think mm. twice, it also, it also creates an environment where people um, put human rights, actual, actual human rights into our economy, mm. which has been delinked actually um, during the Clinton administration, I believe. Um, and with the, you know, with this false hope that China will, will change, which was a huge mistake at that time. So, mm -hmm. and what has been the U S government's response to the captain nations coalition? Well, um, we actually had a meeting with secretary Pompeo last mm. week. Um, it was extremely inspirational, at least for me, because one member from each of the captive nations, specifically three nations that, that are under the captivity of the PRC, and as well as one representative from Kazakhstan that is a huge and a very, very important nation for the Belt and Road Initiative. They were all there. Our Mongolian friends, especially they, um, one of them actually dressed up in the traditional Mongol Mongolian uh, dress, and he actually took a picture with Secretary Pompeo. Um, that was a huge part, but more, more importantly, uh, Secretary Pompeo was very sympathetic. Hmm. He also took extra time, from what I've heard, um, to hear from each members of the captive nations, and he smiled. And he, I remember him him saying, "This is a great initiative." Hmm. And he was in solidarity. Um, and he actually also talked to a Uyghur friend of mine that I brought, um, whose sister has been sentenced 17 years officially now after spending years in the concentration camps, 10 years for having a Quran on her, in her desk, and seven years for praying after her father passed away. So when Secretary Pompeo um, heard her story, um, I remember him specifically saying to her, me and my wife will be praying for you. Hmm. That told me that he, the U, at least from the government's position, there's a lot of sincerity, at least from individuals that have heard these stories, right? And it moved a lot of people. And I believe that um, such policies um, driven by such attitudes will do a lot of great things. And I got to say, a lot of the economic in, uh, actions that the administration has taken has been uh, viewed as extremely helpful for the captive nations um, because they're saying for the first time, people now know where their money is going. Hmm. For the first time, people are realizing that they're utilizing slave labor, right, in China whenever you buy something from made in China, right, mm -hmm. um, to a certain degree, right? Um, and I, this was a win-win situation for, for everybody in the co captive nations, right? One, for the Chinese uh, dissidents here who has been advocating hard to make this issue uh, come to light about slave labor practices uh, under the CCP. Um, and 
for other folks, like Tibetans, Southern Mongolians, and people of East Turkestan, to them, it was another opportunity for people for them to tell their stories, the most updated stories mm -hmm. as to why people have to act. And I think I should also add in the fact that you know they serve as evidence um, in terms of not only why the CCP is, is evil, but also at the same time, how this evil will spread eventually to our shores one day. So how do you, how do you think the CCP would be spreading to the United States? Well, firstly, um, I would say that we're a bit late in that mm -hmm. because they have uh, already been spreading to a point um, in our country through um, business dealings. You know, you mentioned Wall Street earlier. Uh, it's been it's been proven that people of Wall Street, as I would say, um, have been engaged with the CCP in multiple fronts, even affecting policy to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know specifically what types of actions were taken um, that shifted what exact policies that were, but I know for a fact that you know something like that has been going on and it is evil. Also, uh, intellectual property theft. I mean, you know, a lot of that also happened because the CCP had a free reign in our country, um, in our markets. Also, at the same time, you also see this fox hunt that's happening. Um, the FBI Director Christopher Wray uh, talked extensively about that, I, I believe, a couple of months ago. And you have these CCP operatives um, coming in as, you know, business people, students even, or even just different uh, forms of other forms of uh, scholars and academics or even scientists, right? Pretty much uh, infiltrating into the society, right? Um, protected under this banner of don't say anything against the CCP because it's apparently racist, you know, towards us. When in fact, the CCP in no way represents the Chinese people. So, um, you know, it's in a way already has happened. But what I mean by ending up in our shores is that if you look at the history of these captive nations, right, this is where it all started. It all started from this outside force slowly seeping into their society, in a lot of cases, um, with all these promises of benefits, you know, and, and friendship and brotherhood or whatever they may call it, right, and to an eventual takeover, right? Now, I'm not saying that the U.S. will be taking, be, be completely taken over by China in, in some way. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, you know, we might even see a time if we let things run the way that it is being run, it has been run in the, in the past, the CCP um, may be the ones having the final say in things when it comes to our, even our internal affairs. And that is very scary. And we believe that you know, the Captive Nations Coalition could at least serve um, as that one community to remind everyone that, look, if you do not wake up, what has happened to us will probably most likely happen to all of you. And I would like to just end it by, you know, saying that at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Giving a voice to those who are craving for our attention, not because of the sake of wanting attention, but really because they have experienced what oppression really is. So. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I'm glad you were able to squeeze me in after Mike Pompeo. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for watching. You can learn more by going to presentdangerchina.org. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.